In this video series on bees, I've explored the lives and fascinating abilities of only a few of around 20,000 existing species. I've spent some time covering the environmental impact of honeybees as an agricultural animal, both for honey and artificial pollination. But the past few weeks I have hardly touched on the ethical implications of this, other than labeling some practices such as wing clipping and artificial insemination as cruel. And it's about time I elaborate and back up this claim. Hello everyone, my name is Joy and today I will be talking about a bee's ability to experience suffering. In the previous episode I mentioned there were a lot of misconceptions around today's topic. Understandably so, as this is still controversial in the scientific community. But I will try my best to form a coherent picture of the current consensus. As I mentioned in the intro, there are a vast amount of different species of bees, so keep in mind that the information in this video may not apply to all of them, as most research around this topic is done on bees used in agriculture. I won't limit this episode to just the question in the title, as in order to approach this topic properly, it's important to define the following terms. Pain. The International Association for the Study of Pain has recently revised the definition of pain as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with, or resembling that associated with, actual or potential tissue damage. Suffering The state of undergoing pain, distress or hardship. Nociception Neural encoding of impending or actual tissue damage, i.e. noxious stimulation. While it is closely related to pain itself, nociception describes the detection of painful stimuli. It refers to the communication through the peripheral and central nervous system. This requires nociceptors, which are specific receptors within the skin, muscle, skeletal structures and viscera that detect potentially damaging stimuli. So what information do we have about a bee's ability to experience any of these? A good place to start would be the nervous system of a bee. Bees have a brain, an ocellus which is used to detect light intensity during dawn and dusk specifically, where the facet eyes provide more visual information to the brain. A subasophageal ganglion, which is used to control the mouth parts, salivary glands and neck muscles. And seven ganglia throughout the body, which are masses of nervous tissue that send information to the brain, for example about hunger. So that's the hardware we are working with that determines the bee's behavior and experiences. Looking at the complex behavior and nervous system of bees leads many researchers to think that they are beings with experiences whom are conscious and sentient. Sentience being a basic requirement to experience pain. Now I could continue on and on about how fascinatingly intelligent and complex bees are, but I will save that for another video. We are focused on suffering today. So, how do you test for something specific, like pain? In the following section of this video, I'll be discussing several experiments, but for the sake of time, I'll focus more on the findings rather than the methodology. This is definitely worth reading about, however, so make sure to check out the links in the description if you're interested. Senior research technician Julia Gröning and her colleagues conducted two experiments, with 540 bees in each. In these experiments was tested if bees self-medicate after injury, which could mean that they experience the injury. By allowing the bees to free feed in a cage with feeders containing pure sucrose solution and feeders containing sucrose solution with morphine. In one experiment some of the bees were pinched. In the second experiment, a middle leg was amputated. Both experiments included control groups. The researchers hypothesized that if bees feel pain, an injury would prompt them to choose the morphine-containing solution over pure sucrose. The results didn't support this hypothesis, however. Amputated bees did consume more morphine sucrose solution, but they also consumed more pure sucrose solution. According to the researchers, this indicates that amputation prompts an immune response, which entails increased energetic demands. In other words, the amputated bees likely weren't drinking more morphine to relieve pain. They were drinking more in general, because their injury was metabolically taxing. Losing their leg made them hungry. And there have been many of such experiments on different types of insects. 
Fairly recently, a team of neuroscientists discovered that nerve injury drives a heightened state of vigilance and neuropathic sensitization in fruit flies. Their report describes how injury leads to sensitivity in insects, and describes a primordial precursor to neuropathic pain, which may have been an evolutionary advantage, which is why humans and most other mammals have a pain response. The insect world is much too big and diverse to say that if something applies to one animal within it, it applies to all. The experience of physical pain on its own is hard to pinpoint and therefore difficult to prove or disprove. So how would we go about testing if emotional suffering is experienced? To answer this question, it might be practical to clarify that scientists use the term emotions to refer to collections of actions. And numerous species have emoted. According to neuroscientist and philosopher Antonio Damasio of the University of Southern California. Though we cannot be certain that they felt their emotions. In other words, emotions are the body's adaptive response to external events or stimuli. Feelings are the subjective experience of them. So where a human body might emote at the sight of a mountain lion, having their pupils grow wide, breaking out in the sweat, or experiencing increased heart rate, Although closely related, none of this proves the human subjective experience of suffering. As I mentioned previously, this is really hard to prove. Emoting says something about the objective physical response rather than the subjective experience. But the first does not exclude the latter. The nature of this physical response may even be an indicator for the experience of pain. So what about mental suffering in bees? Are they affected by things such as stress, and does this show in their behavior? A few experiments on this took place in 2016 with honeybees, which tested the influence of stress on, amongst other things, foraging behavior. Stressors such as parasitic infestation show to have consequences in the bees' foraging behavior due to energy depletion. For example, stressed bees may show a preference for carbohydrate-rich food to restore their own energy supply over pollen which affects the nutritional well-being of the hive. This research pointed out that this is because stress can decrease sucrose responsiveness. This does not necessarily display emotional suffering as a consequence of stress, but rather an effect on decision-making. Like how a human, after a stressful day, is more inclined to grab a quick sugary treat rather than a healthy meal that requires more effort. So how do we upset a bee? To test how it affects them. Geraldine Wright and her colleagues at Newcastle University decided to research this by shaking a number of her test subjects. This is the part where I warn you not to shake large quantities of bees at home. Spoiler, it upsets bees and any other individuals present. Both shaken and unshaken bees were tested on five mixtures of hexanol, which is an unattractive substance, and octanol, which is an attractive substance, at different concentrations. When the odor of octanol-heavy mixtures was presented to the bees, most of either group advanced towards the mixture, expecting food. They were less enthused by the hexanol-heavy mixtures, pretty much as expected. The shaken bees, however, were more reluctant in general to advance towards the mixtures at all. When a mixture of equal parts hexanol and octanol was presented, the control group was more likely to head towards it, giving it the benefit of the doubt. This happened in more than half of the trails. The unshaken and therefore less stressed bees advanced their mouths in anticipation of food. Shaken bees, on the other hand, were far more likely to recoil. The stress of shaking had turned them into pessimists who interpreted the ambiguous odor as half-threatening rather than half-appetizing. In addition to these behavioral measures, the scientists also tested for changes in bees' systemic neurotransmitter levels after shaking. Transmitters with known roles in insect learning, aversive conditioning, and aggression were all reduced by the procedure. Together, these behavioral and neurochemical tests reveal an unexpected dimension of bee cognition. Scientifically, we can say that bees have a persistent state of negative effect that is triggered by agitation, associated with system-wide changes in neurotransmitters and causes clear, measurable cognitive biases. This means that bees perceive information through a filter of personal experiences and preferences. Biologist Clint Berry of Queen Mary University of London, who also experimented with optimism bias in bees, stated, We didn't show that they feel happy. The evidence showed instead that bees possess the cognitive, behavioral and physiological mechanisms that underlie emotions. 
In a nutshell, for as far as I understand, researchers have found the following. Are bees sentient? Likely, yes. The sources I have found which approach this in varying ways point to the existence of sentience in bees. Do bees feel pain? Inconclusive. Testing for the subjective experience of pain still proves a challenge in general. But what we can say is that the complex behavior and the structure of the nervous system that bees possess indicate a potential evolutionary advantage to the experience of pain, making it likely for bees to possess the ability to feel pain. Are bees capable of suffering? Likely, yes. At risk of being repetitive, I think Dr. Perry summarized it best. The evidence showed bees possess the cognitive, behavioral, and physiological mechanisms that underlie emotions. This shows, for example, in their display of cognitive bias. For now, I stand by my opinion that acts such as wing clipping, artificial insemination, and the taking of honey from bees are cruel, or at least inflict suffering. To add to that, while doing my research for this video, I've become more opposed to most experiments involving animals, including insects. I definitely see the value of gaining a better understanding of how pain works in all animals, including humans. But if we value the experience of pain as an incentive to avoid causing it, our research methods seem hardly justified. Even if we could find a surefire method of proving or disproving the experience of pain in a specific animal, the one thing we'll be able to find out for sure is that we've been monstrous to our fellow earthlings. Which is why I reject the commodification of animals in general, even if they would not display a closely relatable experience of pain, which, in my opinion, they do. I will leave you with the words of a leading voice in animal rights activism, Dr. Charles Magel, who, on April 24th, 1983, delivered a speech at the Mobilization for Animals rally. But before I do so, I'd like to invite you to the description of this video where you can find all of my sources. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video. Bye! All one has to do is to ask them two questions. Question number one. Why do you perform these experiments on the primates? And their answer is... Because they are like us. Question number two, why is it morally okay to perform these experiments on these primates? And their answer is, because they are not like us.